and allow everyone in. Come. Okay, as everyone comes into the room. Right. Hello, as everyone in. Right, okay, there's still more people. There's about 20, 30 people in, but we're gonna start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session of uh, Islamic courses at Muslimics. Right, today we're very, it's going to be a discussion, very interesting one as well, some, something very passionate to me and I've been very involved and we've got some good friends and uh, academics and intellectuals here. It's titled Critical Review Formation of a New Islamic Education Studies Programme connecting interdisciplinary inquiry with transformative pedagogy 10 years on. And really the main guest today and, and additional guest contributions. Uh, the first guest obviously is Dr. Abdullah Shahin, who's a reader in Islamic education from the Department for Education Studies at the University of Warwick. And very honored and privileged to have Dr. Imran, who's the education head of Islamic education at Markfield Institute, uh, also in the UK, in Leicester. And honored to have Sheikh Mohammed uh, Ismail Bhutta from Ibrahim College as well. Right, just a quick um, reminder to everyone it is being recorded. Please kindly put your uh, devices on um, um, uh, what is it, mute. Uh, if you're not registered, leave your email address on the group. Uh, and there is a QA session as well. So, very important, please, uh, you adhere to our. Um, well, our rules really before we start. Okay, so um, a quick in, quick introduction to the subjects. As you probably know, everyone knows about Islamic education. Everyone's heard about it, and and you know the education uh, challenge facing contemporary Muslim society is multifaceted, as we all know, and it's a very complicated history to untangle. Most of the focus on Islamic studies, as you probably know, in various aspects of Islamic, and too often, very, very often, and perhaps the most neglected area of study is really Islamic education, which is a subject in its own right. Um, looking how Muslims can teach Islam, is teach Islam and benefit from its own pedagogy philosophy. And the other thing important, very important to us now with the rise of Islamic uh, maktabs and uh, universities and schools, uh, how do we professionalize the quality of our Muslim teachers uh, and students as well? Because at the end of the day, our, our sons and daughters go to these schools um, and friends as well, and how they can transform their lives into a meaningful, uh, in, into meaningful human beings while still remain to the challenges of post-modernity. Okay, so I'm really, we're going to start off uh, with uh, Dr. Shahin. And those who don't know, Dr. Shahin is the first holder of the UK's first readish, readership in Islamic education from the University of Warwick. It was established kindly by the Randari Family Trust. Uh, Dr. Shahin leads the graduate Islamic education studies program at the Department for Education Studies at Warwick University. Uh, he's the author, which we've been very involved in as well many years back, of New Directions, uh, in Islamic education, pedagogy and identity formation. And you can go to Cube uh, Publications where you can buy the book and recently edited the special issue of religions on Islamic education in contemporary world traditions, rearticulations uh, and transformations. So uh, without further ado, Salaam Alaikum, Dr. Sharikin, welcome. Wa Alaikum Salaam. And Salaam Alaikum to Dr. Imran and Sheikh Mohammed, uh, welcome as well. I'm just gonna unmute you as well. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, can you hear us? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Great to be here. Great, thank you. And we're going to get your contributions a bit later, but we're going to start off with Dr. Shahin. Uh, Dr. Shahin, I think you've got a presentation you just want to make for the next 15 minutes or so maximum, and then we can get uh, some contribution from uh, Imran and then Shahin from Sheikh Mohammed as well. So over to you, uh, Dr. Shahin. If just going to make you... Allow me yep, to skip just share that. Is that ready? Okay, how are we? <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. It's blank at the moment, but go ahead, yeah. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay. 
الحمد لله على دين الإسلام وتوفيق الإيمان والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So I'm very pleased yet to find myself contributing to Nizan's um, wonderful uh, interactive session this afternoon, <coughs> Islamic education. <coughs> um, we have in the past uh, done some similar seminars. I think since the format is online, uh, we are trying to really this time keep it to minimum presentation but allow maximum space for maybe reflection and, and discussion. So I just put a PowerPoint because it helps us to focus on certain key points uh, that I will be covering briefly, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then my colleagues, Dr. Imran and Sheikh Mohammed uh, will share some of their reflections on the topic. <clears throat> and then hopefully we will hear from you, which is the most important point. We want to be useful to the audience who obviously are sacrificing their, their afternoon to be with us. So thank you, Mizan, uh, for organizing this uh, wonderful session sure. again. Just a minute, you've got 15 minutes maximum for the presentation, then we move on to the- That's uh, right, so I've got 15 minutes and then we've got five, five minutes each from my colleagues, inshallah. Um, so the idea is I'm hoping to communicate, convey to you some basic uh, background information, how I myself found uh, you know, my way into Islamic education and how I currently uh, ended up actually leading on probably UK's first Islamic education studies program, which is delivered in a mainstream university within a faculty of education framework. And the idea is can Islamic education studies become um, a field of empirical research, uh, scholarly study, but also professional development. And we kind of summarize this with the idea of interdisciplinarity, which I will explain what I mean by that inquiry, but also most crucially a transformative pedagogy. Uh, and I've got roughly around 10, 15 years of experience, and I'm hoping to convey this within space that Mizans allows me 10 minutes. <clears throat> um, okay, so the basic outline. So you know, I, in, in a sense, it is tying to my own personal, professional, really, story. I can only tell this story very briefly by only invoking some cities and their names, because this, these locations were the key uh, in me focusing on Islamic education-related issues. You know, how do we, what is Islamic attitude to knowledge? How do we learn and teach Islam? Why is it that teaching and learning of Islam does not appear to be facilitating faith development, transformative change, for example. Um, so these issues, I really became involved uh, through some time I spent in these cities. I probably should have mentioned my native Ankara, but I forgot about Ankara because it's so far away now from my life, sadly. Uh, but Birmingham was crucial. I had the opportunity of conducting UK's first empirical study of measuring attitudes towards Islam among British Muslim young people, sixth form college students. The idea was to find out how Muslim young people who are living in the midst of a highly modern context, secular education, without having access to a com confident and competent Islamic education provision, make sense of their faith. So how multicultural secular context <clears throat> shapes religious agency of Muslim, British Muslim young people within a Muslim minority context and how Islamic education helps or doesn't help that process. So it's a long story. It's almost five, six years of my doctorate, which was published as Misa mentioned in a book. Uh, to cut the long story short, education appeared to have been, Islamic education particularly, facilitating formation of four clause identities, which are really inward looking and there's not much transformation doesn't en enable the learner to access to Islamic knowledge, engage and practice, neither it actually re helps the individual relate to the wider world around him or her. So obviously there are limitations of being situated within a Muslim minority context. So we thought maybe uh, this rather alarming findings uh, that tells us the link between Islamic education and personal agency are quite negative, 
maybe in a Muslim majority context where there is no feeling of being a minority could influence. So I found myself way to Kuwait City, probably one of the most affluent contexts. Sadly, the findings, the empirical findings, reveal the same type of problem that Islamic education appears to be in fact creating different sheds of foreclosed mindsets. It wasn't much different in reality. Although the fact that of course they had much you know, material help and, and support around them, whereas young people in Birmingham got stuck with a very transmission oriented education model in the mosque and madras and Darulu. Uh, and that was an issue because if Islamic education is only producing foreclosed mindsets, the chances are we really Islam cannot shape modern world. We have to just accept that it is part of cultural heritage and full stop. But then when you look at the story of- Can you define what foreclosed mindset is for the people? That's right. So I'll, I'll explain this in a, in a minute. Just let me just jump one. So we have used a psychosocial model of measuring religiosity and the assumption, the theory says, uh, one's sense of who one is or identity formation takes place alongside a continuum from commitment to exploration. So if you have a commitment to a cause, you have presence of identity psychologically. But if that commitment has not undergone reflection, investigation, search, you end up becoming foreclosed. That means you simply become, in our language, muqallid. You basically develop a culture of following and you become depersonalized. You don't really know why you are a Muslim, for example. You simply emulate what has been given to you. Whereas if your commitment to Islam is underpinned by reflective process of inquiry and search, the chances are you have a moratorium, you have a space of looking at options. And if you resolve the process in a, in a positive way, you become achieved so-called psychologically, because now, you are actually making a personal claim to be Muslim and you try to evidence that with whatever you know. And if, if, even if you don't know psychologically, you say, look, these are my limitations. Therefore, you know the boundaries. Even this psychologically is maturity, rushed, basically. And then you have people who are not interested in religion at all, diffused identities. So clearly the majority of the empirical findings were falling on the four clause mindsets, really, which is you know, not autonomous, not being able to take initiatives, and of course, have a very negative attitude towards plurality. And it's all to do with transmitting certain idealized content to next generation. So that's a psychosocial model you can look at in much more detail if you like. Uh, so that, in a sense, made me to think now some serious questions about what is education in Islam? Is it really in the Quran and the prophetic tradition, education is simply ta'lim, transmission of certain knowledge? Of course, you hear a lot of stories about this glorious ilm, you know, ilm and ulama and all these huge emphasis. But then when you unpack the Quran, the Quran actually seems really much more interested in the way in which an individual makes sense of that ilm, the way in, in which the ilm transforms the, the person, rather than simply carrying the knowledge. And you, anybody who reads the Quran, you will easily see uh, the fact that <clears throat> the Quran begins with critique of Jewish rabbis, for example, just using the legal knowledge to oppress other people. So ilm in itself is not an end. What ilm does to you is the preoccupation of the Quran. And that really gave me the question of really, if no concept of ilm is not education, what is education then? Again, long story, and I stumbled up with this great 11th, 10th century scholar, Rab al Isfahani, one who actually greatly influenced Ghazali himself, is Mufradat al-Quran, it's a very simple. He, I opened the first chapter trying to find out what commentators think about education in his dictionary. And I looked at ilm ta'alim, that wasn't much definition. But when I looked at the concept of rub entry, he just simply said, a rub fil is fil asri at tarbiya. He just simply said, rub actually, God is education. Right, what does that mean? And he began to give an explanation. He said, well, okay, you know, tarbiya is, what is it? facilitate growth of an organism through a stage-like processes to fulfill their potentials. 
he this gave definite, he, he gave very clear, definitive. Very clear uh, definition in his arm, very clear. So this is this is not reading John Dovey, I don't know, Karl Marx into, into tradition. So we don't have to look at Weber, we don't have to look exactly. at- Exactly. Right, okay. Be, this this will, I will come to you because many people have read Isfahani, but they never picked up on this stuff. Right. It's very curious, why? The question is because they were not really guided by educational interpretation or, or question. They were just looking at probably mystically or ethically or mm -hmm. philosophically. Mm -hmm. But if you're an educator, when you look at that definition, it mm -hmm. really moves you. And then or, it gives or, the, or you have the other model, as you mentioned. You just go to exactly. adab, 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 but that's about it. Yes, that, that was the third question. Because when I looked at currently great uh, philosophers that we assume they are philosophers of education in Islam, yeah. they obviously created a model of Islamic education really as a reaction to the colonial experience. Right. So the West is all materialism, hence education in Islam has to be all spiritual, all moral. Hence they like the idea of adab. But right. the story of adab is complicated. Adab really, we have no time to discuss about that. It's a crucial concept, but it, adab was made publicized by people like Ibn al-Muqaffa, the Persian converts to Islam, who right. really realized they need to bring their Sasanian courtly right. culture to the Arabs who are now ruling the world. And Adab became, honestly, his, his famous book, Adab al-Kabir wa Adab al-Sagir. Mm -hmm. These two books are actually courtly education of Sasanian type, where right. the Umayyad dynasty emulated basically. But the word, of course, turned into moral meanings and then ta'deeb, the coercion. I don't want to go into that because it's a very We'll come back to that later because obviously we'll come back to that because we have right. two modes, triple IT's model uh, and right. we have so that, the that, that, model, right? That's right. So we have a model based around the concept of ADAP and I try to develop a model based on Terbiya basically. Right. Because okay. I believe Terbiya is an alternative model. It is embedded in the Quran and prophetic tradition. Mm -hmm. and it tells us holistic perception of human nature. Come on. With with, with actual development, leadership, and, 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 and even physical education. So to me, theologically, terbiya is the key concept. Although in contemporary cultures like Urdu, Turkish, or Kurdish, this concept had become a little bit misunderstood typically. We have to go back and rediscover the transformative meaning on this concept. Come on. Yeah. And that, that led me to Mark Field where I experimented now with, with a terbiya -based, based transformative model. Mm -hmm. How do you make a change? How do we make a change in the real sense? So I, I began to look at teachers because teachers are crucial. If you can change teachers' attitudes to become transformative, the chances are they will facilitate a learning and teaching that is transformative, producing not foreclosed mindset in their Maktab, Madrasa, Darul Islamic School, University, but exploratory. So I began to experiment whether I could turn this idea into a professional development course that is recognized. This is where I realized the importance of making Islamic education not only part of theological sciences, but also education sciences. And I was very, you know, really pleased that Markfield hosted that experiment. For six, seven years, I taught at Markfield. And I, as I did that, I came across these wonderful people like Dr. Imran, uh, blessed with meaning and working with people like him. Uh, and I found great positive response to that transformative terbiya-based MA program. Of course, gradually my, my journey with community has helped, taken me to Warwick because I you, you didn't to... feel the other, because there's lots of other mainstream educational programs um, weren't dealing with the Muslim community in particular. That's right, yeah, that's very right. true. Because but... you, you have lots of Muslim scholars saying Islamic education, Islamic education, blah, 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 right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but, so we, um, we'll come back yeah. to that, Mizan, mm. if you allow me, because obviously no. I don't want to take much time. I want to yeah. imagine that we have a of this question. That's fine, okay. So, the concept of Islamic education is really totally misunderstood in many ways, because when you're asking what is, what is really meant by Islamic education, not really clear answers. And we'll come back to that, what is really meant by Islamic education. Noted, that's okay. That's question. Absolutely. Now, Warwick is interesting because uh, considering European Muslim diaspora, and these issues are not only internal issues, if you look at the size. So we have growing interest in Islamic theological education. We have growing interest in to find out how our Darulums are going to be integrated into wider education system. We have Mekhtar, Madrasa Islamic schools, but yet we don't have not only a Muslim teacher education college, specialist college, but also we don't have actually Islamic education models could make sense in this complex context. And there are of course political issues and social issues that we have to bear in mind. So my idea was if I could uh, get Islamic education studies recognized as 
part of education sciences, humanities and social sciences, the chances are the students who are studying Islamic education, they will be opening up themselves to this kind of areas. And this is where the creativity comes into it. Then you are developing research, you are developing interest in humanities. Islamic education once more becomes creative and transformative. Now, time is Sorry. against. So can you just my, make my, F5? If you yeah, can four, press four, F5. Four minutes. Four minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question was last 10 years. You need to make the slides bigger. If you control, if you do control F5, so a lot of people can't see the slides. All right. Is it bigger now? Yeah, I think it's full screen. Is it bigger now? Whoever asked that question, I think it is. Bigger? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So my question of the last 10 years has been really rethinking the meaning of being Islamically educated in the 20, 20, 21st century world. Because I don't believe we have currently models that are responding to that immediate question. So therefore, and this is not a question to do with only Islamic side, but also Islamic higher learning within the context of Muslim majority context, where we have lots of emulation of the Western secular university, sadly failing to produce a model. So the meaning of being Islamically educated is a crucial question to untangle. Now, here we have a crucial point. Because Islam has produced a very complex epistemic, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, knowledge you know, in, in the tradition, so it is a huge knowledge. When you look at it, you feel like intimidated today because you can't even spend all your time counting the title of the books written by the great scholars. So when you see this epistemic, uh, I suppose, humility, and then you say, okay, what can I do? I can only really emulate. But this is a really wrong way of starting because you don't need to look at the epistemic, the knowledge outcome. You have to look at how that knowledge was generated in the first place. What motivated Muslims to produce this complex type of knowledge? Here we have a problem because Islamic real epistemology today is like an archival archaeology. They're just like studying lots of past intellectual, I suppose, ideas. There isn't much empirical foundation of Islamic epistemology. And in an area like education, if you don't have empirical knowledge, you can't really develop interventions. There's no way you can, you can spend all your time studying Imam Ghazali, but if you do not have an empirical study today, how young people make sense of Imam Ghazali, you will not really educationally advance anything. So empirical foundation, empirical studies is a crucial missing element in Islamic epistemology. And the second important missing element is educational pedagogic really hermeneutics. I think people can't see the slides, Dr. Shaheen. I think they're still struggling. I'm getting lots of messages. Okay, it's... well, I don't know what else I can do. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll email the people the slides. Don't worry, folks. Right. You know, yeah. So, Listen, and then we'll so, uh, get some questions and we'll hopefully get these slides over. Right. Okay, so the empirical research is missing. Second method problem is education pedagogic uh, turn in Islamic hermeneutics. So the interpretation frameworks we have are all intellectual, usually exercised by textual scholars and historians of ideas. This is interesting, but not the answer. If you want to really reconstruct creative Islamic education responses, that we need really a specific interpretation, just like the way I, I looked at uh, Svahani's book, because mm -hmm. I was educationally guided, I saw the kind of gold really within what he was saying. But if you are simply a theologian, mm -hmm. I suppose, a philosopher, you will spend all your time embellishing these wonderful ideas. You will never say what is interesting in here educationally. This is what we call uh, basically educational pedagogic hermeneutics, in its application in understanding Islamic heritage. It's a missing point. Lots of people who write about education in Islam sadly have got no clue about the fact that their hermeneutic shift must reflect educational priorities. And that goes, with the that goes with the Orientalists. We've got tons of people writing about uh, history of Islamic education ideas, but they're really historians describing institutions and events. They don't have passion how they bring them back here, these concept of ideas. So they're not educationalists at all in that sense. Exactly, or, 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 or specialists in education and pedagogic sciences. And final point is really, I realized in education, you, you got to have an image of a scholar who's an activist in the positive sense. Because education is all about change, bringing about change. You have to cross boundaries. You cannot really stay within one genre. And also you, you have to be embedding your discourse, your play in the community. So in, in order for your intervention to make sense, you've got to have community behind you basically. And I was very blessed that I really got two of these <laughs> crucial elements. You know, my journey to, to, to Warwick, as you just mentioned, was really supported, helped by British Muslim 
philanthropy, which is very crucial. I'm very pleased to see small British Muslim families now are investing a lot into the education sector, which is crucial for the future of British Islam and European Islam. But then also we need to be qualifying ourselves, our discourse to make sense of other people because we are part of a wider network. So Islamic higher education cannot be separating itself from the education discourse, the higher education. So I was very pleased that you know, Warwick University probably pioneered in enabling uh, this, this boundary of crossing the disciplinary boundaries. Because Islamic studies, which is mostly talk about genre, it is in, insufficient. My, this is my thesis, this is my third thesis. Islamic education is a good, interesting area study, has mm -hmm. lots of you know, things within area studies, but really it is no good it comes when it comes to engaging with education. So here we have a first attempt to embed Islamic education studies as part of wider education pedagogic sciences. And alhamdulillah, it seems to be working. And we will hear from some of my, inshallah, colleagues who I'm working with to give feedback. So final point, mm -hmm. Islamic education studies, exciting, could become interdisciplinary, could become actually practical solution to transform within our communities toward positive development. And, but we have to recognize that needs to create a transformative really, a reading edge, edge to it. So I see Islamic education studies as independent area of study, independent of Islamic, from Islamic studies. studies. From Islamic studies. Exactly. And it has a specific mandate, it mm -hmm. has met it, and it has a way of really uh, making a distinctive, distinctive impact. If you enable Islamic education studies to produce specialists, the chances are we will have a better position to look at some pressing issues like how we can qualify our teachers in, in Europe now. Muslim teacher qualification. How do you develop a quali qualification framework for Islamic educators? Right. This cannot be answered with simply sitting in a, a theological framework. You've got to cross and look at the education sciences. You've got to look at the pedagogic sciences. So it's interdisciplinary. And I believe if we do that specialism building up, which I'm glad to see with my small efforts, I can see young people are really, when they are being, in a sense, given the chance, are excelling in bringing traditional Islamic theological thinking into education sciences. And there is a hope that we can actually produce an effectively working model mm -hmm. of transformative Islamic education at early years level, when there's a mm -hmm. maktab, mm -hmm. and Islamic higher education level, Barulu. Right. Jazakumullah khair. Right, no, I'll okay, pass just, on to- Before I hand over to Umar, just, we just wanna um, get our understanding. So in the framing of things, look, we've got a huge number of Muslims who go to these weekend schools or evening schools, and the teachers who go to such schools, there is no training of them on how to measure, how they're seeing the improvement of the children, let alone the uh, student, uh, let alone the teachers themselves. They don't have any professional qualifications. But before that, what you're saying from your own research and from your own thing, the way we have approached Islamic education is that it's been within the framework of Islamic studies, which is a problem. Right? You're not saying, you know, if you want to do kalam, you want to do dogma, you want to do etc, etc, et history, that's fine. But Islamic studies has to be a subject in itself and its own. And within that, there's two aspects which you've developed and built. Number one, we do have a hermeneutics, we do have a education philosophy uh, over the ages, right from, you know, uh, right from the first uh, revelation till, till now. We haven't really drawn upon that. The second thing is, and one of the criticism of uh, many of our uh, education, so-called education uh, thought leaders um, is they talk about, for example, Ghazali, but they don't really have a methodology which is evidence-based. And you, what you're saying, you found you're using classical Islamic education philosophy and you're taking an evidence-based approach, empirical evidence-based approach to measure the transformation. And that's what yeah. you've done with your uh, program over the last 10 years. Just, just to tell people out there what, what we've done. Now, um, we're gonna, before I bring Imran in, so Im Imran, and then you've got Sheikh Mohammed. Sheikh Mohammed's gonna be talking mainly about the maktabs, the evening schools or the weekend schools, which 99% of the Muslim Ummah go to. And Imran is also not only, he's a graduate of the program, he's also- Darul actually. Darul okay. Uh, but at the same time, Imran is also gonna talk about not only who's gone on the program and now he's teaching the program, but he's also gonna talk about how he's utilized the program as well. So Imran uh, from Markfield, uh, welcome. I'll ask you to unmute. Bismillah. 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, thank you first and foremost for inviting me and having me, um, having me here. Um, of course, Dr. Shaheen has parlayed and um, given a really good overview of the course itself and how it began. I think for me, if I just begin quickly to set the context in terms of how I uh, became engaged with Dr. Shaheen and his work, and it was really, um, I was working abroad. I was looking to do a PhD program really within the area of human self-development, but I had um, not really formalized a study as such. So I was working on the proposal uh, with Sussex University and I came across Dr. Shaheen's work and I decided to visit him uh, whilst I was here in the UK. And Dr. Shaheen, if you want to exit, exit the screen, exit the, um, what is it? Oh, stop sharing. Okay. Stop sharing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So you yeah, like Dr. Imran. Do you like sharing? Things? I know sharing is caring, but it can be bearing sometimes. Mm. Dr. Imran. I completely <laughs> throwing me off, but never mind. Here we go. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So yeah, I, I got to meet Dr. Shaheen. Um the, that hour, I think, meeting turned into about five hours. Um, you know, we had an amazingly long discussion, my entire perception of actually what human development entailed and what education entailed changed from you know school teachers and exams and that sort of thing to actually what I was really focused on which was realizing human potential it was something I was involved in professionally from a career wise so for me it made sense to look at this but I never thought about looking at this from an educational perspective so something we eventually well explored and discovered and settled on was the aspect of leadership and looking at how leadership actually informs and, and not only informs, but shapes to a larger degree, the followers. And in this case, from an educational setting, um, it was really impressed upon me because I'd never really focused on this before. Actually the role of the teachers within schools and educational institutes at different levels, all the way from nursery to higher education. So really once that discussion had begun, my initial work really for my PhD was centered on how educational leaders within Islamic or Muslim institutes here in the UK are shaping the religiosity and therefore the identity of their students. So for me, that became, you know, began a fascinating journey really for the last five, six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, it led me to understanding um, what well, the UK Muslim community a lot better and also really starting to understand some of the issues Dr. Shaheen has spoken about. I mean, it's just the, the issues are the same all around the Muslim world, more or less, not just the UK, yeah? Yeah, I know. But as, yeah. since our focus is on the UK, I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. we've got an international audience here. That's right. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. So one of the things that came across, which was very apparent initially for me as both a student and then once I got to teach, was that um, many of the students were unfortunately very unaware of the rich Islamic tradition. And that includes some of the things you've already touched upon, you mm. know, the scientific approaches, methodological approaches, etc., which were developed you know, to a high degree in the classical age and sometimes not appreciated because society may not have caught up at that time. But certainly if you are a student within an Alim program for eight, nine, 10 years, you should be aware of the diverse views and, 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 and really the heritage and the richness of it. So one thing we realized was these people were very aware, the students of the heritage, but couldn't really realize it or make sense of it in the contemporary context. So right. it led us to a couple a, a number of sort of um, analysis points, should we say, just right mm -hmm. before I began teaching my, my course at Markfield. And, and they were centered around this. Mm -hmm. We understood that most of the tradition, you know, produced, unfortunately, foreclosed students, but- mm -hmm. Who are your type of students? Were they Dar al -Ulum students? Were they just- uh, Well, most of our students are Dar al -Ulum students. Right. Um, okay. They come from very traditional backgrounds. Right. They, they undergo or have gone through Alim programs. So they right. are very well qualified. Yeah. Um, they're very aware of the, the tradition, the heritage. It's yeah. really now about getting them to engage with it in a dialogical process and making right. sense of it in a contemporary environment. So right. one thing I just want to add here is that initially we realized a couple of things. And this is where, really where Dr. Shaheen's work came in, you know, really to aid my own understanding and transformation into mm -hmm. sort of teaching, which was students we had were actually very well versed with the tradition. So had great sort of knowledge of the tradition. Mm -hmm. So had great memories, great knowledge of great bodies of work from the classical era, spoke languages, often mm -hmm. multiple languages, polymaths, mm -hmm. and were well traveled. So actually through the experience of their traditional education, uh -huh. There is an aspect that we've missed that actually you know, gives them the potential 
to achieve what Dr. Shaheen has spoken about. And it's mm. something that we now at Markfield are focusing a lot more on and, and, and something I can discuss. So what, what you're saying is, look, they've got a lot of great skills. They've got a lot of knowledge, but they couldn't translate it. Uh, and part of the problem was also maybe using current Western models, which are fine, but if you've already got 1400 years of rich yeah. education philosophy, mm. right? Philosophical models, you can use that because it's from your source, from your tradition. And we'll come, we'll come back later on, talk about empirical empiricism as well, which is something very important. I'm gonna to come to Sheikh Mohammed. I'm just gonna ask you to unmute. And you're gonna talk about Sheikh Mohammed, welcome. And you're gonna be talking about the uh, maktabs, aren't you? Which is the evening classes and the weekend classes, which 99% of the Muslim community go to, which is probably the most important project in the Muslim community, not just Islamic studies and producing lots of graduates and somehow the are almost going to revive and so and so, but we're talking about the 99% the who learn their religion at these weekend evening classes. Sheikh Mohammed, go on, please, from Ibrahim yeah. College. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and uh, jazakumullah khairan for having me. Um, here this afternoon and just share my thoughts and my reflections. Um, I was actually supposed to be speaking about Darul Ulum's Mizan. Oh, Darul Ulum, um, Stam, tamam. Darul Ulum's yeah. fine, that's okay. Yeah. However, I can speak about the maktabs from my previous experience, but yeah, maybe both. if we get time... Yeah, and yeah we'll have time, we'll talk about both. Yeah. But uh, just talking about my experience um, at a, a higher kind of Islamic education level. So my um, uh, experience goes back almost 10 years ago. So this is after 7-7 seven, seven, and where there is a context where, um, you know, uh, the scrutiny on Darul Ulooms and, you know, what's going on in Darul Ulooms and how these young people are being trained to become the future faith leaders within the community was in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, so just after that, um, you know, that's when I started teaching mm -hmm. and I started teaching Arabic language. Um, and from there, I started to move into teaching uh, Quranic studies, so uh, Ulum al Quran, uh, Tafsir, and so on. Um, but as I started teaching and as I started engaging with other teachers at Darul Ulooms and also my own colleagues at the um, uh, Darul Ulum that I was teaching at, or the hybrid Darul Ulum, if you want to use that term, then my interest in education started to develop. Specifically, you know, how the education of these students at Darul Ulooms take place. I mean, I myself am a product of the Darul Ulum. Right. Um, and just looking at, okay, what is the Darul Ulum doing in order to prepare them for the new challenges that the 21st century mm -hmm. um, is sort of bringing to them? So this is where I find I found myself, um, uh, you, you know, uh, finding this course at uh, Warwick University, the PGA, mm -hmm. the Postgraduate Award, which I was interested in. And I thought to myself, okay, let's see what this course is all about. Who is Dr. Abdullah Sahin? And, you know, what is this transformative pedagogy that he's talking about? Mm. So I thought to myself, okay, let's, uh, you know, let me go and, um, you know, uh, become a part of this course. And it was there where I really realized that, you know what, the whole thing about educating and being an educator mm -hmm. is more than just about the teaching and the curriculum. Mm -hmm. right? It's a whole philosophy that underpins all of that theory and that concept and that practice. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was the first thing. So that really was an eye opener for me. And Alhamdulillah, I continued in the master's course where it brings me to my current kind of research in Darul mm -hmm. Ulooms. Mm -hmm. So. What I mean, I'll, I'll bring it to this. I'll say that when we look at the discourse within Darul Ulooms, I mean, I for one do see the value of the Darul Ulum, and as Dr. Imran was mentioning, the kind of things that the Darul Ulum student is learning and how accomplished they become within the Islamic sciences and so so on and so forth mm. and, and 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 what that tradition um uh, has and how rich it is but there's also i mean i'm an insider and i'm not looking at this from a securitization perspective where a lot of people are looking at darul ulums because they're worried about terrorism or they're worried about you know uh, extremism in the community and so on and so forth but mm. I'm simply looking at it as a person who's interested in education. Uh -huh. So what is it that the Darul Ulum needs to do in order to 
truly educate these young people to become firm or to become, uh, you know, future faith leaders. So that that's the angle I'm coming from, okay? Um, and because personally, I care about the Darul Ulum um, uh, uh, Institute and that traditional learning is very dear to me. However, I think sometimes the way that we imagine um, uh, the, the, the Darul Ulum or the higher Islamic studies and how it took place and how it progressed and how it developed over the years is something that maybe we need to review and look at, especially okay, so when, when, when you did your masters, what did you do with the masters? In Islam? How did it benefit you in your teaching? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. yeah so, 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 so the fundamental point that I took from it is that mm. the way we teach as teachers in the Darul Ulum mm. is just as important as what we teach in the Darul Ulum. Meaning, and I th meaning yeah. that a lot of the times we focus too much on reviewing and developing curriculum. Right. But we don't give enough focus on the people who are teaching or educating or those who are going to be delivering that curriculum to, right. to, 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 so, to those students. So did you feel that as a teacher yourself that you weren't being developed with the tools? So, for example, you had students in the Darul and they were listening to you. They got bored. OK, so surely that's that's indicative uh, or they weren't progressing. So that is that because of the students just bored and can't be bothered? Or is it because it could be just you, you don't have the tools to engage with them and to wake them up and say, hey, guys, you know, are they being, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, my, my theory is that we have this presumption that because we've gone through a system, we're able to teach that system. Uh, simply because we've been through an educational process, it does not mean that we can actually then be the educator because there, there, there is a lot more to being an educator than just being in the classroom and having gone through a particular syllabus or curriculum. For example, I mean, in my current research, what I'm hearing quite a bit is that because I'm exploring the experiences of Darul Ulum teachers who are teaching Quranic studies. Mm -hmm. And what I tend to hear quite often is, well, I'm able to teach what I'm teaching simply because I'm a product of that process. Right. So I think I know what I'm doing. So I don't really need to go to a, uh, an educational institute to maybe study how to teach, etc. Mm. How my teacher taught me, that's how I'm teaching my students. And, and that's good enough. I don't and that's do good it. enough and it's yeah. working. Right. Um, or, or, or they see that, well, it's working. But the reality yeah. is the student's not really progressing um, uh, and they themselves are probably not developing professionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, th that's the key question here. Right. And that's that, that's a question that we need to explore. And that's where the empirical research comes into this. Right. And again, it comes back to that empirical based understanding of what's going on, right. because we can't just make an assumption and say, look, that's what it is based on X, Y and Z. But there has to be hard evidence that, look, we've been in that environment, been in that context and, and we've done that exploration. Mm -hmm. And this is what the data is revealing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we need to maybe revisit this area that area or the other area mm -hmm. and what seems to be developing or the theme that seems to be developing for me is that there is a need to have some sort of training for these educators or for these Darul Ulum teachers at that level because it's not just about being competent and knowledgeable within your field and your science right okay so what it is the the master's program program which is quite unique there's nothing really out there in the Muslim world, gave them the tools to go and engage with the tradition, using the tradition, using the education of philosophical models, uh, and, and then and also gave them some social, social sciences, uh, practical um, tools as well. So there's no point of taking a philosophy or a model if you can't have evidence as well and how to build evidence. Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, I, I've... I've... I've, I, I've come across this one statement that was once said in a mm. sort of like teacher's training um, uh, uh, module that I took, that practice without theory is blind and theory without practice is empty. So it's almost like saying that, you know what, there needs to be uh, somewhere where you marry the two together because, right. you know, um, most definitely, as, you, as you've mentioned, there is a need for 
that empirical research uh, in order to really focus and zoom in on and what, what empirical is. evidence did you do so for example you've done the, you did a survey what what did you find from your empirical based approach yeah so so i i, I i've already shared some some of um sort of like the themes that are coming through because mm-hmm. i'm still undergoing are you still actually, doing research exactly yeah that's right, right. at the moment so, you're doing it in the dar but you're not doing it in the maktabs is that correct or are you doing it that, both? no i'm specifically focusing on um the traditional kind of seminaries and those institutes that are that are providing sort of the alim course or the alimia studies course yeah. yeah and that could be in different settings mm-hmm. um whether it's full-time part-time boarding mm-hmm. male female and so on and so forth okay fantastic thank you so much uh sheikh mohammed okay so dr mm-hmm. shahin going back to you look we're going to open up the q a very sh- before we open up the q a folks if you want to ask some questions to uh dr shahin or dr imran sheikh mohammed about the experience is not a problem but Obviously, please try to write them on chat or you can raise your hand on Zoom. Um, I want to talk about your model, your philosophical model. Yeah, the Shah, what is it called? The Shahin something model? Dr. Shahin? I'm talking about the um, Muslim subjectivity interview. Which is an important thing because you see, look, sure. I mean, sure. I, I, I could look at your program and think, look, I am in an Islamic university in Fulanistan, right? And I'm the rector of Fulanistan University, right? And I can say, look, why do I need to use your model? Right? I can use, you know, um, uh, a modern Western model, which has got empirical based uh, values and thoughts. I could just plug it in and Islamic University of Fulanistan has produced the goods. OK, we've got lots of great Muslim teachers. Mashallah, we're doing the job. What is it about your education philosophical model? All right. Uh, we're not going to talk about evidence based because evidence you can collect data and then you know that's social sciences in general but what specifically about your education philosophical model what, what's so special about it what's so muslimic about it compared to weber or compared to modern educational philosophical models of today of uh, of what's his name um who died recently what's his name from the institute of islamic institute of education but you catch my drift Bella. Yes. <clears throat> And this is something important because people need to make a distinction between the various education philosophical models out there. Because a lot of people don't believe there is such thing. Right. Now, of course, Mizan, we have to now qualify these concepts. Yeah. When you Please. say philosophy, isn't it? A th- we need a theoretical model as well, right. just yes. from Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, clearly, what really you know is education in Islam requires theoretical reflection. We've got to have a theological, philosophical, isn't it, basis of our take on what education is in Islam. I remember I gave examples. Usually people begin with the concept of ilm, knowledge. So they built a philosophy around knowledge and knowledge transmission, ta'aleem. Or some people who are mystically, probably theosophically inclined, they look at the moral, spiritual quality of adab, adab. Uh, whereas- for Which is the model of Istak and Naqib Abbas. Yeah, this, and they this, keep on going on about. Is, Adab, yeah, Adab, is, Adab, but, yeah, probably um, Ilm and Adab hmm. uh, came out of the 1979, the very first Islamic right. uh, international conference on Islamic education held in Mecca, if you remember. Yeah. And this model was developed. Again, my concern is not because it's all wrong. My concern is these philosophical ideas read into the tradition mm-hmm. because these, young, these, these scholars were really reacting to colonial pressure. You see, now right. this is four, four, four decades you know, on. We can't simply have the same psychology of being reactionary right. while we are trying to search for what is education in Islam? What does it mean to be educated? And they couldn't, they couldn't measure that. To me, to me this, is where, this is where the weaknesses comes into the existing models. And your so program did that, you're saying. Exactly. You're, so right. ilm and knowledge is also misleading because people do not read the Quran mm-hmm. within an educational hermeneutic framework. They right. don't realize Actually, the Quran does talk about ilm because mm-hmm. it is awareness. In fact, in Arabic, ilm means not simply information, mm-hmm. it means developing competence to feel near divine presence. Something transforms you. Right. But ilm, the Quran, uses, sees the danger of mm-hmm. having simply a banking model. Students who work with me, they would know Ferrer, Paula Ferrer's famous strategy. Quran is not talking about dumping lots of knowledge and then memorize and then regurgitate. This is not what the Quranic education model is all about. It's the other way around. It's actually with care, facilitate a compassionate transformation. 
But so, what, 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 what difference would that be if, with, for example, the Tripolite's Islamization of Education project? Right. So, example, so, I mean, they've been, they've got great universities, they've run the education models. That's but, right. Yes, but yes. Do they so, have, yeah. yeah, so if you allow me, mm. you can take this and we'll probably hear from other colleagues. What Absolutely, it's yeah. The Islamization is, isn't it, which, which was the natural outcome of that 1979 exercise, because the idea was there is this secular invasion. But yet, within that secular invasion, which produced parallel systems in the Islamic world of education, that means binary mindsets, secular and Islamic so-called mindset. But in the secular, there was this science curriculum, which obviously they couldn't deny. So right. the idea was, why don't we simply Islamize the good bit and right. leave, leave behind the rest? But this is very simplistic because you have to look at the package. You know, in, in, in the Western context, philosophy of education does not simply come from scientism, there is humanities, there's all philosophy behind it. So Islamization was simplistic in my view, in, in this sense, because it assumed you can simply, mm -hmm. simply take a knowledge system, mm -hmm. and put a couple of verses and Quranic uh, verses and prophetic traditions, mm -hmm. you will Islamize. But that was- I mean, their argument would be, that's fine. And then we'll do empirical evidence, we'll measure the number of students who went well, through, and hey, presto, you know, Bob's your uncle, well, there you go. I mean, obviously that, that is, that is of course they can defend, but you know, four, cent four decades later, because the politics has changed now, yeah. I don't hear anybody actually defending Islamization of knowledge. It, it is two openings. One is triple IT USA, yeah. of course, in Southeast Asia and the Malaysian, right. uh, the competition. Once there was a competition to say who invent, invented the idea, they were competing to have ownership. Now, with the change of politics after 9-11, nobody's owning even Islamization of knowledge. Right. So that is that end. Is and this is where your program comes in. Yeah, yes. So my, my view is this, we should mm. really start with empirical. We should, we should say what is happening on the ground. Let's listen to young people, how they are, how education is working within our education spaces. Mm -hmm. So you need now tools to measure that. And of course, my uh, psychosocial model of mm. assessing the impact of education activity on the formation of character or mm. identity is mm. one means of producing a bit of evidence of saying, well, actually, yeah. what is interesting in, in the Mecca Madrasa mm -hmm. is producing foreclosed mindsets. Are you aware of this stuff? Mm. If you're happy, fine, carry on. But if you're not happy, if you want to make young people autonomous on their own agency, Articulate Islam in a creative way. Mm -hmm. Isn't it great maturity of their faith, right? Maybe these people yeah. like they like their fam. It's a family protection model. They like that. They want to. Well, you know, this is uh, the whole point. So clearly, if you if you the, the bottom line is this, I think, and to me, mm. you are going to have an Islamic education model. Mm. Your education philosophy should make sense of is on, on Islamic framework. Right. Okay. So that's the key word. Your, your, your education you have to have, framework. You have yeah. to have a theology yeah. first of all. Right. But your theology could be simplistic, mm -hmm. but your theology could be transformative. So I was, in a sense, the model that I've been working on, which right. is based on the concept of terbia, which right. I believe has got Islamically meaningful framework. Right. But it also gives us the crucial point is it, it gives us a transformative pedagogic framework we can work with. And so, the transformative, you're measuring that transformation. Exactly, right? with, with the empirical. So the word terbiya, if you unpack it, you will yeah. see right. that it's actually embedded in uh, what, what I call compassionate transformation, really. Right. What, what, bottom line. So clearly, we need such Islamic education models. Mine is just only one model. Okay. But how do we develop this? We can't develop this armchair stuff. You can't simply philosophize. Yeah, we've got, we got 2 billion Muslims in the world. You've you got, you got to listen, you got to listen, young right. people, right. you got to involve their experiences. You've got to look at the teachers. Right. What is knowledge? How, what is ideal knowledge to them? How knowledge transforms and what it doesn't. Right. So you have to have, an, therefore, an empirical base to your educa Islamic education. Okay, so you've had 10 years of this program. What are the successes? Very short. Well, what are the successes, successes besides successes, the successes? Yeah. The successes are with you, Dr. Uh, Imran so do you want to, and yeah. Muhammad Buta. Look, are, are they here with us? Embodiment of the success of this program. Alhamdulillah. Which means, you know, my, my, my discourse made yeah. sense to some people. Right. Uh, this, this, now, joking aside, the fact mm. is, over uh, when I first began over almost eight years ago, they told me nobody will turn up to your classes because this is just too much challenging. Yeah. And you are simply, you know, creating unwarranted problems. Right. <laughs> by throwing questions. But in fact, other way around, if anybody has a chance to look at my book, I have a chapter, two chapters, telling the stories of how people react to this model. I would say, <laughs> gradually, we have built up now real interest 
in reframing the way we look at education in this time. Okay, so that's less. important. Right. And, and I can only say that at Warwick, for example, we have this PGA, as Sheikh Mohammed mentioned, students mm -hmm. come onto my course one term. Right. They look at the content, they don't like it, they just go away. Right. But they, they the benefit of doubt, they look at the content and they say, well, okay, I've spent a term. What, what has happened to me? Have I changed, been challenged? My experience of now three years at Warwick, uh -huh. Almost seventy percent of those who are at the PGA wish to continue to the whole program, right. which I take to be a quite a good basis of success. I would say, uh -huh. and of course, plus we have Dr. Imran teaching at Markfield the same philosophy of basically education, which still I believe attracts students, independent of Islamic studies. We didn't have time to discuss about this. Uh -huh. uh, so therefore, I would say I'm really encouraged uh -huh. that actually it has attracted not only professional educators. Darwin graduates, but also education activists who are really thinking, how do we make education space creative in our communities? This is what really is the most crucial point in all of this stuff, because we have to enable young people to have access to competent Islamic education, literacy, provision. Uh -huh. We have to enable young people to be inspired by this Islamic knowledge. Uh -huh. And it should really enable them to grow into their humanity as well as faith. Right. That is at stake. And okay. I believe we yeah. are making a bit of progress, inshallah. Imran, do you want to say a few words? What, what do you, I mean, you, how long have you been running the program? So I've taken over the program full time this year. Previous mm. to this, I was running it on a part time basis. Uh, but the education program, you know, once Dr. Shaheen had moved on, um, kind of was ignored for a short while uh, until we came back. But what we've seen in the last couple of years since we've been back involved is that the student numbers have increased. We have around 15 to, you know, anywhere between 15 to 30 students on the BA and the MA program. So we're running this at the undergrad and the postgraduate level. Uh, the most pleasing aspect, if I could just continue from Dr. Shaheen, is that mm, the outcomes. A, a, a measure of a measure of our success actually is that what mm. we're finding is a lot of our students mm. in their final year projects actually are not only focused on education specifically, but you begin to see within their mm. writing. The fight, the, you know, the, the appreciation for the tradition and their past sort of experiences, uh -huh. which we didn't see before. So when Dr. Shaheen had begun the course and we were part of the MA program in terms of observing, helping out, etc., as, as well as doing our PhD, the attitude of the students was slightly different, slightly right. more defensive. And I think Dr. Shaheen really had to work hard in those early years uh -huh. to break things down. But as we've moved along, especially now in my experience in the last two years, is that students are a lot more open to ideas. Secondly, mm -hmm. if, and again, this is something we've worked on in the foreground, which is we've actually started to link tradition all the way back. So we're kind of using this double hermeneutical model, which is right. to actually look at a lot of the contemporary theories that you, you, know, you classify as the Western theories. Actually, mm -hmm. if we look at the heritage, of course, you will find a great deal of work on these ideas, these already done from yeah. the Muslim, yeah, from the Muslim point of view. That is not to say that they weren't influenced by the Greeks and the Persians and, yeah. and the Hindus from before, but that only goes to show the dynamic nature of that civilization, which was able to take ideas from across the world. It was open, it, it was creative. This idea, yeah, this idea of Islamicization actually begins with Muhammad Sallam and the Sahaba and everybody else at the beginning because Absolutely. they're not claiming to bring new things. They say, look, we've got the old world. We're reordering, giving new meaning to these things. And I think right. this what is Dr. Key Shaheen, word. Right. yeah, Dr. Shaheen in his humbleness, and mm -hmm. I've often said this to him because he's always <laughs> downplaying his work. Yeah. He's in many ways presenting, a, and if you look at philosophy, actually, educational philosophy is the original philosophy in any tradition. And right. along the way, what's happened is it's been slightly watered down and it's been amalgamated with, you know, issues of life and what's life mean, etc. Yeah. And what Dr. Shaheen is doing here is he's purifying in many ways an aspect of the Islamic tradition, which is the philosophical aspect, which hasn't been understood historically and has been mm -hmm. marginalized. Yeah. If we look at some of those ideas now, they are not only very contemporary, but very relevant and applicable. And one of those mm -hmm. applicable ideas is this notion of transforming the self. The mm. nafs itself, which is yeah. to do with personality studies, psychology, etc., yeah. which now forms the hub, really, of modern day education itself. So, right. in that sense, we're already sort of twelve years ahead. Yeah. It's just we need to now bring the awareness, which really leads me on to say that across the world, again, I think Dr. Shaheen is slightly being humble in the fact that yeah. this is an ongoing project. We are looking for educators from 
every part of the world to contribute, to disagree, exactly. to agree, whatever, to argue. So we can start producing our journals, our magazines, our conferences, where we can go back and forth, and we can start having our you know perspectives from right. different angles. So exactly. and they already exist; they just need to be evolved and retransmitted or translated for the modern. Right. World. Okay. We've got a lot of questions. For some people wanting. I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Farah in because she's held her hand. I'm going to unmute you, Dr. Farah from Cambridge, who's also part of the education department there. I've just unmuted you, Dr. Farah. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Um, so, Assalam. first of all, Jazakallah khairan for really interesting dialogue, really interesting discussion. And alhamdulillah, um, there's been a huge amount of work done both at Markfield and at Warwick, and it's really good to hear the developments and how things are have have moved on there, and you know the new the new kind of ideas that are coming out of the work that. Dr. Shaheen and Dr. Siddha Zayed done and Mark Field. I've got two questions. Um, the first question is probably fairly straightforward. I'd be really interested to hear, um, like, uh, between Dr. Shaheen's tenure at Mark Field and the current sort of course, you have, a, a, I think, Dr. Fuller is here. And um, I'd really be interested to hear her sort of input of what happens and how that the, the work in Islamic education at Markfield develops between Dr. Shaheen and, and Dr. Sudha Zais now. So that's my first question. Excellent. My second question is um, more to do with um, this whole discussion about the value of empirical research in regards to moving the field forward. And my question here is, well, I've got a few things to say, which I may, people might find useful. Firstly, um, to say that, Triple IT's Islamization or what happened in the Makkah conferences or ISTAG and the Qiblatas is just is simply a reaction to colonialism and it's like a knee-jerk response. Mm. I, I feel is a little bit unjust to the level of work and development that went there. Mm -hmm. um, I would be in, and, and that relates to the point about empirical research. I mean, I'm, I engage in empirical research myself. I also engage in teacher-led inquiry, so that import, you know, it's the importance of teachers being able to use those skills and to evaluate their own work and in their own classroom. So it's not that I'm against empirical research as such, mm. but to say that the to critique the the Islamization of knowledge movement, which had its faults, but to critique it on the basis that they didn't use sufficient empirical research strikes me as and at the same time say that it's a response to, uh, to you know, the, the West, is that, well, the whole notion of measuring and the, that kind of quantitative social science and, or even when it comes into qualitative, the whole notion of empiricism mm -hmm. itself is a very modern concept. So mm -hmm. when we're mo trying to move this field forward, from my perspective, don't we, you know, Yes, um, young, you know, younger scholars need to understand modernity. They need to understand how research functions, but they mm. equally need to have a critique of its value because what I see, for example, in, in say, Naqib al thas's theory is an awareness that these things are not measurable in the way that the West seeks to measure it. And there's an awareness that goes, that critiques modernity from very much from a classical Islamic source as opposed to, a knee-jerk kind of reaction. And I feel that there's a lot of depth there that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should learn from the people who've come before. And I would really like to hear um, what, 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 you know, what, how, what, like how do we go beyond just saying, okay, we need some empirical research. What, what, what is there that we can move forward? I've got my own ideas, but I'd really like to hear from the people who are here today. So those are my two questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah. Before I can, I, can I just bring in Do uh, Dr. Feller as well, and then I'll, then I'll get um, the panelists to respond. Uh, Dr. Feller Lahma, you're on. Hello, I've unmuted you. Are you there? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, uh, thank you so much to, uh, to everyone. Thank you for uh, Dr. Shaheen and uh, Dr. Imran. Um, yes, I took the, uh, I was the course leader for the Ahmed for the past three years, not this year, Dr. Imran took over. Uh, so certainly I would say uh, this uh, kind of uh, course is needed in, uh, and I personally needed it myself as a student in 2003 
when I approached Markfield for Islamic education, and they said, we don't offer that course. Uh, because I was in teacher training myself before in the 90s. I did on Tajweed, the impact of Tajweed and pedagogy of teaching Tajweed at the time as research. In 2003 and four, my dissertation on Markfield for MA Islamic studies was actually education. And I asked for my MA to be in education, but it was not a validated course at that time. It didn't exist. Dr. Shaheen was not there. Um, so I um, did the impact of ICT on students' motivation and attainment in fiqh. I was teaching in Dar al Ulum and leading uh, uh, the Islamic studies uh, department. And I noticed there is a need for empirical research then, and we have to do something about it. So that was kind of uh, my teacher training at the Open University and also the uh, 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 doing action research on my own teaching of Islamic studies. So there were actually many people at different places. It was kind of a thriving area of research that is coming out. Uh, Farah was doing her PhD at the time. Mm -hmm. I was doing my PhD at the time at the University of Nottingham Muslim Schooling. So this is certainly an area when we have to do research and we have to uh, that research to uh, to feed into our understanding of Islamic education and teaching of Islamic education, you know, of not mm -hmm. Teaching of Islam uh, of Muslims, I would say. Sure. So, uh, what, what is your question? Um, my, so, my question, my question mm -hmm. is because as a, is a, about empirical, as um, as Dr. Farah said, mm -hmm. subjectivity and objectivity in research, uh, measuring by itself is very complex in research. So mm -hmm. to say uh, that we take it for granted as something we can measure it is very complex and very problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I would raise many questions on that, on religiosity and what type of religiosity to, yeah, we benefit from it, certainly. Mm -hmm. There is some aspects we take for that and mm -hmm. we learn from it. However, we have to remain critical of that. The other thing as well for teacher training provision, I think it is necessary and is needed. And there are so many writings in mm -hmm. Arabic that have been written on asking for teacher training in the field of Islamic education. And from that, Ibn Ashur himself, mm -hmm. he wrote about, upon that in the 19, in, in 1900, around that time, from 1930, uh, uh, around that time. This is time, Ibn Ashur Ibn, from Tunisia, right? Ibn Ashur, yeah, mm -hmm. Ibn Ashur, he was leading transformation, pedagogical change in Zaytuna mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So it was there and he's based it on kind of um, his observations on what happened, a clear analysis of that was going on at his time and is impressive the type of suggestions he put forward to that. So by this itself, it, mm -hmm. the idea was in there, but mm -hmm. actually to see the course and to, be, to see the students working through that, so certainly it's an area that we need to put forward. And I would ask, you know, what is a new that we are putting forward? And I think it's it's uh, it's in the pedagogy, it's in social, uh, you know, in society, there are so many aspects that we have to bear uh, um, uh, our attention uh, to. And I've seen from my research how Muslim schooling in the practice, they're developing different, uh, different approach to Islamic studies, not one approach in Muslim schools. There are many approach, uh, approaches, and I, I uh, researched eight, uh, eight Muslim schools from 2007 to 2012 and 2018 to 2019. So there's a lot going on mm -hmm. and we need, it's an area that I think we need to um, really uh, develop as a discipline. I agree mm -hmm. that's the discipline at mm -hmm. the university broader than pedagogy. Uh, what do they think? Thank you so much. Fantastic, Dr. Lahma. We need to bring you back for another session and we need to find out about some of your research findings as well. Thank you so much. You. Dr. So much. Dr. Shahin, um, some very interesting comments, questions, criticisms. Do you, you know, especially about empiricism, given that empiricism is based on, you know, um, you, know uh, you know, empiricism, there's a problem with it. There's an inherent problem when you're imposing it on um, an Islamic uh, pedagogy. What are your thoughts? Yeah. See, Mizan, because obviously our, session is really not focused on examining yeah um as far as some of these concepts in depth so mm. i feel there's a bit of a confusion okay 
in in what really, uh, at least on my part, what I was trying to communicate. Sure. Certainly, okay. certainly I was not advocating scientism. Like I've written yeah. a paper okay. on the danger of scientism. The point about empirical is the fact that uh, you could have models. Mm -hmm. I think that you know they are the best models to teach Islamic education, let us say, yeah. in the early years education. I believe Sister Farah has halaqa. Yeah. for example. Yeah, we were talking about the Naqib yeah, Atas' model. Yeah. This, this is interesting, or, or Atas' or Atas's work. The point about empirical is, what empirical does is a means of producing a, a framework to assess how the key stakeholders involved in the process make sense of that approach. This could be students, it could be teachers, and you collect information, right? And then you say, 10 people said this, of course there is sub subjectivism. But with empirical, at least you, you make a case and people will challenge your empirical uh, findings, no problems. In education, without having empirical evidence, interventions becomes really uh, not working, basically. You've got to have some evidence to say, I have this intervention, just like action research we use in education. You know, you know, I'm a teacher, I've been teaching Quranic studies like Sheikh Muhammad is now doing. You know, I've been teaching Quranic studies, Ulum al-Quran in uh, Ibrahim College for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But how do I develop this? Well, the best way would be to ask your questions. Uh -huh. How do they feel learning about Ulum al Quran? Isn't it? And then you interview them and you get some ideas from them and then you build on it. Nobody's defending uh, the empirical scientism to be kind of the guiding way forward. The all be end, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah, that, that exactly. So my criticism of Atas is nothing to do with empirical. Yeah. I believe fundamentally his, his theological concepts, philosophical concepts are really. Uh, in need of rethinking. So that an adapt-based framework, I feel, in, as inadequate. It's not that it's really new. It's me, mainly Ibn Arabi reframed in well, the world. We don't want to, because, you see, this is unfair. You know, this is maybe those who are following these ideas, they will feel yeah. that their masters are being attacked or something. It's not right. really like this. We, ha we have to be honest. We don't want yeah. to obviously have criticism of someone. We've yeah. got to have probably time to unpack, for example, Artas's contribution to Islamic education. So because time is not allowing, we don't want to really yeah. make these short commentaries. But what I can say, over 10 years, I prefer to work with the concept of terbia. Right. I think I have got every right to do so. And I can justify mm -hmm. my choice of working with the terbia concept, mm -hmm. because I believe there is enough theology behind this. And I believe that Atas's model lacks theological framework. But that is my right as a scholar to produce right. my own. Okay. So, so the criticism of, of, of uh, Islamization or adapt is nothing to do with the scientism or science. Mm -hmm. Although it would be brilliant to say we had four decades of Islamization of knowledge uh, program. Mm -hmm. Why don't we produce some research to find out empirically mm -hmm. the institutions, the learning cultures, the programs developed? Why mm -hmm. can't we assess them to just look at their strengths and weaknesses? Right. Nobody wants to throw the baby out of you know the wash water, anything like this. There's still some good things in there, yeah. Sure, but my, my, my view is this, uh, I can only speak from my research mm -hmm. uh, and my work based on six foreign college students' experiences of their religious agency told me, literally, you got to rethink what education is in Islam. And humbly, my investigation of the Quran and the prophetic traditions mm -hmm. led me to the concept of terbia. Sure. And I believe I have every right, like any other scholar or researcher, to justify their own philosophy of education in Islam. Before let's I bring in the next flowers, question, let, yeah. let's let, let's hundred flowers to blossom. So there's no need to be really kind of emotional yeah. on this. I would say Islam yeah. is is a, is very much open to epistemic humbleness. Right. You develop a theory, mm -hmm. you have evidence. You don't have evidence. You discuss and debate. This is how isn't it consensus? How scholarly work develops sure. basically. So uh, I'm sorry if if the comments you know are perceived to be maybe a little bit immature, but of course there's no, no time to unpack it. I'm sure. simply saying that an adapt-based Islamic education philosophy just basically does not make sense to me. And mm -hmm. I had to uh, rethink what would be my key concept. And I preferred, after seeing the evidence mm -hmm. from the Quran and the prophetic tradition, uh, but by the way, the word adapt does not occur in the Quran. But as terbia does occur, so there is a difference between adab and terbia. Big difference. That, right. was, that was one of my reasons when I saw when I saw uh, Raghab al-Sahani's definition of education. I thought, mm. well, who do we follow? Tradition? Do we follow Abbas or do we follow uh, Ghazali or do we follow somebody before that? So mm. clearly, 
I realized Isfahani's depiction of terbiyah related to God, Rububiyyah and Rab, was much more overwhelmingly powerful. But that's a pre-modern world. It's a Persianite world, right? Yeah, it, it doesn't really We're matter. living in what, the West what, here. Yeah. That's right. What, 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 what is crucial? To me, Raghav Asfahani hmm. unpacked the Quranic vocabulary of education brilliantly. Right. And this is what I like. And we have right to like or to criticize Come the views and perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that has become really my model because Terbiya does allow change, development, and transformation. This, some people could still love Adab and Adab. That's mm -hmm. fair enough. People That's work fine. with Ilim. Fair enough. Or maybe you could bring all of them together. That's mm -hmm. fair enough. I'm going to so take a question please, from, um, yeah, from yeah, please do, do not yeah. get do not get uh, you know this kind of misunderstanding. Yeah, just lead, leading Nobody is really yeah. criticizing yeah. because the space is not enough to actually focus. Okay. However, we got to bring, in my view, uh, theoretical insights, theological insights, with an empirical evidence. I've got a question. Really yeah. a working model. Come on. Okay, question from Mustafa Mansour. He's been waiting for ages. Mansour, Bismillah. Have I muted you? You can ask directly, bro. Okay. Hello. Yes. Why is that? Okay. So my question actually uh, is going to be summarized. When I think you've covered quite a bit of it already. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation here about the outcome of what we call as terbiya, or the misunderstanding between terbiya and taalim. Your focus is on the perfection of human character, or uh, taking people to their maximum potential. Um, what is the, my question to you is what, how have you measured the effectiveness of your model in uh, the students of your course in terms of transforming their character and their life? Right, Mustafa, very good question. Very good question, yeah. Do, do, do you have time to read, read my book, Mustafa? Um, yeah, I do. I, but, yeah, I do. <laughs> I would, uh, yes, I bought I, you the book, Mustafa. What's going on? <laughs> I, I have. I have. Yes, I do believe that Mustafa. I did spend a lot of time <laughs> actually detailing this very good question. This is a really, really good question. How do you know that Chinese yeah. model works? Well, the evidence is in chapter seven. Mm. See and read. If you are not convinced, no, no. let me know. Doctor Abdullah, it's not. The evidence is not in chapter seven. The evidence is in the lives of your students. That's the question. Yeah, it's not in the book. It is in the book because I actually tell yeah, yeah. the interview students how how they react being part of that process for 12 months. And then I gave them actually from their perspectives, Mustafa, the evidence, okay. evidence is there. I was so, just asking you, how did you measure that? Yeah. Um, if you could share that, you know, in this conversation, if not, of course, I can refer to chapter seven of your book. Sure. So there are, of course, ways. This is where, um, this is where the empirical means are crucial. So you, you, could, you could do pre and post, isn't it? So what I did when people took my course way back at Markfield, I used to have a pre-course interview, yeah, to create a profile of what we call learning identities and teaching identities, Mustafa. And, and you have ready-made profiles to actually measure, you know, what this person sees the ideal knowledge, how does he, he or she thinks the best way to learn, the best way to teach, yeah? So I used to have these semi-structured interviews to collect this learning and teaching identities, which really were all geared into a transmission text and teacher-centered model. And then after 12 months, I used to do post interviews, basically asking, you've now gone through these modules, which are pedagogy education specific, have you reconsidered your position as to what is the ideal teaching and learning? Well, 70, 80% of people who were participants of the interview, they all felt they now need to revisit what they really thought was the ideal way of learning and teaching. It was certainly not transmission and instruction. It was all about why don't we actually create a, a learning environment where teacher is only a facilitator, not simply somebody who just lectures. Yeah. So there are ways of measuring the impact uh, of the course that you teach. And to me, of course, the key thing is learning and teaching identities of these uh, uh, students. Essentially, it was in the, it's the, the data is in the book. And exactly, the data, right. data, what Jazakallah read is in the book, indeed. And mm. in fact, this data has been now replicated by mm. a different part of students. Uh, so there are many ways of 
Uh, you see, education is a practical field. Uh -huh. You know, it doesn't mean that when you measure something, you just put the dot on it and you say, we have now uh -huh. once for all. No, <clears throat> empirical data is humble. It yeah. just gives us yeah. how some people- It's just an indication. It's just an indication. Exactly. <clears throat> and then over time, you build a, a pattern. You say, well, okay, look, yeah. I have been having graduates of Darul coming to my course, all starting with a transmission instruction model of uh -huh. learning and teaching identity. 70% end up saying, well, actually, no, learning and teaching could be much more interactive, reflective, critical. Uh -huh. That is an evidence that uh -huh. because it does indicate people have actually considered, take on board, reflected uh -huh. on it, and felt they could actually now maybe move beyond a transmission instruction model. Fantastic. We've got another question from Mustak Ahmed. He's been waiting for ages. We've got about 10 questions. We've only got about 15 minutes maximum left, guys. Uh, please make your questions relevant, please. Uh, if you don't want, if you want to have a go, read his book first before you make a question, unless you know what you're talking about. I'm sorry for being blunt. That's me. That's for you. We are all welcome to have a go. No problems. This okay. Is, this so Mushtaq, I have unmuted you. Where are you now? You've gone. Uh, you don't want to ask a question, Mushtaq? Uh, let me try again, Mushtaq. Okay. So let me go to Aisha. I've just unmuted you. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I'm very happy that we are talking about this subject. This is a subject very close to my heart. And I would just like to say that uh, if you could also um, evaluate Iqbal's concept of Hudi, it's a model of Tarbiya, and um, I've tried to develop a theory of customization of education from it, and I'm working on it. I'm also working on a social development index, which might be quite close to what you've already done. So Good. I would like to compare with whatever you're doing. And also pyramid of social development, because when we are teaching uh, sociology, we are generally not using uh, Muslim frameworks. So these are things that could be developed. So Iqbal is negating the factory model of education, and he suggests different levels of faith and accordingly different levels of development of Hudi, which is actually the Tarbiya. And he says Good. that each self is an individual that needs an education tailored to his own specific needs. So coming to my question, which I have two, I'm just uh, wanting to know that uh, whilst you're working on the social and spiritual development, uh, is there any uh, area of financial empowerment that you're working on as well for your students? And also if counseling uh, for psychological or emotional development is included in your program. Then uh, secondly, I would just like to ask, uh, because I've been working on redefining literacy, I feel that unless and until we redefine literacy to include uh, character building or values in it, then uh, we're just looking at knowledge otherwise. So I think newer definitions of literacy, I've developed one and I would like to share with you sometime, uh, we should include values, knowledge, skills and competencies as well as character building if we really want to bring <clears throat> sustainable change. So I would like to know if uh, this is a dimension you're working on redefining literacy and also an assessment framework. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> yes, I should, uh, this is a really, really very good point. I'm very pleased <clears throat> with your questions and, of course, the way in which you are operationalizing, as it were, some of the key concepts we were talking about. Uh, we have uh, actually a dedicated module on um, Islamic framework of human development. I think that is, a, that is a very important point, because if you want to have a terbiya that is transformative, empowering the agency of the learners, uh, the fundamental framework is to have to, you have to fall back on what does Islam say about human development? Is it holistic? Is it one dimensional? Uh, so we have actually currently we're just coming to an end. Our module, second module is at, at the Warwick program is um, the, the kind of transformative pedagogic rethinking, which begins to look at human uh, Islamic approach to human development. And this is where I think uh, the a developmental model that facilitates empowering the learner agency with all dimensions comes into it. And of course, uh, that at the very core is psychology and it's a very core, of course, is the kind of curing aspect of education. When I said education is compassionate transformation, I was really referring to Terbia as linking to a caring and loving process of facilitating growth into something. Uh, and that, that begins with ref respecting the learner. Often in our models, everything begins with instruction and, and the knowledge, but actually it's the other way around. 
and, and, and Islam has, of course, you refer to Iqbal, Iqbal, Iqbal brilliant, because he's, his entire really poetic imagination is based on human developmental capacities that the Quran offers. As you know, of course, Iqbal was very much interested towards the end of his life to even set up an Islamic university. You may probably, some of you would know. So his, he was really into making education transformative in many ways. And I believe that you are right in your reading. His idea was very close to Terbiya. Do you didn't see that sort of stuff in Pakistan, in any of the graduates coming from Pakistan mm -hmm. or the Islamic well, university, you know, because people love to go about Islamabad, Islamic university and education <laughs> champions and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, that's a, that, 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 I don't know. I haven't really looked at into this, but mm. the point is Iqbal is crucial and it's, it's neglected Iqbal's philosophy of education. But I do believe Iqbal has a lot still to offer in terms of, because he obviously has seen in, in many ways in his philosophical thinking, the power of education, both in the West and Islamic tradition. So his pain was, why is it that current Islamic education is not firing, rekindling, creating Islamic imagination? Oh, but did is Iqbal himself well, have an e Islamic education? Because he was trained in Western... Western and Western. Islamic, of course. Yeah, of yeah. course he had law and he had degrees, but he, his own yeah. self-education was mm -hmm. enough to, to grapple with some of the key problems within the classical Islamic education debate. Right. In the but Sufi. some would say the jawab was just a critique using Western yeah. epistemology. What, right? what, is yeah. crucial, he, what is crucial, what is crucial was all those spirituality, emotional development works praised within the Islamic mystical heritage, right. but that wasn't really transformative enough. And he's right. right. The Quran really does not simply want a pure devotional educational model. The Quran right. wants to bring aql, isn't it? Lisan and Saul. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? The tradition says. Right. So Quran both the heart and mind. Reflective, yeah. The Quran wants reflective, questioning mind to, to integrate with the devotion and spirituality. And I think Iqbal is brilliant. He has really done that. I would love to hear more from Sister Aisha mm -hmm. whether she's aware of this application of some of the Iqbal's ideas into creating practical and applicable models of Islamic education. So, but very good question. Thank you, Aisha. You're welcome. I just like to add that Iqbal's model is too revolutionary to be adopted. It has been ignored on purpose. So we can discuss this later, inshallah. I know. No, Iqbal is one of my heroes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. I'm going to bring in Mushtaq. Finally, you're back. Mushtaq, you're live now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mizan, for the opportunity. Um, I just want to ask beyond the theoretical debate of paradigm and uh, pedagogy, I would like to ask um, uh, if you look at two traditions of um, Islamic uh, kind of culture, the Indo uh, the Indo Islamic culture, in the Francis Robinson book, um, the Islamic culture ulama and the Islamic culture of South Asia, he mm. talks about uh, this uh, idea of rational science and the revealed knowledge in mm. the form of Darsi Islamia. And uh, in, in, in practice, we can see perhaps uh, the current Darul Ulum we have uh, in the UK and beyond, uh, probably partially adopting um, the curriculum of Darsi Islamia, well, no, uh, you know, very limited version of it, not the broad in the way perhaps uh, Francis Robinson talks about in his book. Uh, I mean, from my personal experience of visiting fairs, what I found very fascinating visiting the Jamia Kahrawain is when I went to the library to see the library and uh, the librarian was kind enough to actually show me the original works of Ibn Khaldun, one yeah. of the books uh, written by Ibn Khaldun and uh, by Ibn Rushd. And here in the book Ibn Rushd, he talks about, <laughs> which to my, uh, to my, uh, uh, I mean, really a uh, surprise in the sense that he was talking about how to wash a, a dead uh, Muslim body and how to prepare uh, a burial and how to give ghusl according to Islam ritual. This is one of the foremost um, sort of uh, a thinker of um, uh, philosophy talking about a theological um, a nuances of how to uh, bury properly or wash a uh, Muslim dead body properly uh, according to our rituals, which I found really, really fascinating, very interesting. So my point is, I see there's that, uh, you know, what Francis uh, talks about in his book, um, talking about in his book about this rational and revealed knowledge in the form of Darsin and Zamiya continued uh, into uh, in the in Indian subcontinental culture. Then, then towards the end, we have this uh, response to colonialism where 
uh, it takes a very rigid and very uh, kind of limited form in the sense that it's more about preservation of the faith and and and, and not, nothing beyond. So I see I see in Muslim tradition uh, from my personal experience in Fez and the madrasa, you know, it's amazing. Uh, Twelve hundred years old, one thousand years old, eight hundred okay, so years that, old. What's your, what's your question? So my point is, my hmm. point is, it seems like we have that balance. You know, we do not have that binary that you talked about in the synopsis of for this uh, webinar. Uh, so where where have we gone wrong? Um, you know, where did this come from? Is it was it just a response to colonialism uh, or, 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 or perhaps uh, the paradigm that exists uh, at the moment in the in Muslim traditions, perhaps there is, there is a demand for it. It is, it is being sustained. There, there are students who are studying this. So I just uh, wondered the thoughts of um, uh, Dr. Um, Shahin on this, uh, as well as um, if you can elaborate, um, I don't think you can actually would have time probably elaborate on Adab and um, uh, Tarbiya concept that you're talking about, but I doubt you will have time for it. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Okay, very quickly, Mushtaq. we still got about five questions coming through. Right. It sounds like Brother Mushtaq would really enjoy PGA course. Or he could read the book as well. Because mm. the questions you are raising are very good questions. You are absolutely right, isn't it? To cut a long story short, Muslim education was creative because it found a way to produce an integrated model of education, which you rightly point out, in, uh, start with naqliya, the transmission, transmitted knowledge. The word transmitted should not be misunderstood here. So Muslim did not simply pass on uh, hadith or, or ulum al-Quran without reflecting, but basically the religious sciences. And then the key thing was they rose up the challenge when they encountered with the Greek uh, rational sciences. Instead of giving up, they actually tried to engage. So it created a curriculum which had uh, Islamic sciences, classical sciences, but also increasingly rational sciences. But most crucially, which I'm most interested in, mm -hmm. is the Aliyat, isn't it? Aliyat. Aliyah means auxiliary sciences. Right. So people always look at Aqliyat and Naqliyat, they forgot the Aliyat. That means means to achieve. So they found a way to marry what today we call it humanities mm -hmm. with actual theological studies. Brilliant. So Aliyat meant study of language, mm -hmm. study of logic, and created this, this created a, what I call integrated model of Islamic higher learning. Indeed, it led into all kinds of pedagogic creativity. We have no time to go into These are pre-modern societies, but what we're talking yeah, about now. Yeah, pre-modern context. So, so we, we have- We, we have had an example from uh, Farah, Dr. Farah, I think not Farah. We, um, we Lachna do have- on, it, um, Yes, on, if I just finish, yeah, sure. yeah. we do have pre-modern Islamic integrated models of higher education curriculum based on integration of these three types of sciences. Now, the story of Dars and Nizami, as you know, is it's, it's different because it yeah. falls into subcontinent and it is now 17, 18 centuries. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about reforms beginning to emerge, yeah. not only because of the colonial experience, but well mm -hmm. before that, because the Mongols need, needed to run an empire. Yeah. So you got to have a system of education to train yeah, to, to create the bureaucrats. Yeah. The so as, as you know, the Mullah Nizami Din actually, as some people mis misunderstand, Mullah Nizami Din actually was producing a curriculum not for creating alims as yeah, such. It's, it's more bureaucrats. It's bureaucrats. Yeah. Part of that national Islami was obviously Islamic sciences because yeah. all Islamic higher learning begins with Islamic sciences. Mm. The trouble is today, what we call it that's Nizami in our Daru looms mm. is simply borrowing the Islamic bit of that curriculum. It's a watered down curriculum. Sadly, yeah. and then yeah. that of course you can see caused all kinds of issues and problems. But what do you think of um, uh, Dr. Fah uh, Lahmaz Ibn Ashur's um, when he tried to do because he was teacher education he, is different. Teacher education mm. Nizam is different. Mm. Teacher education, of course, we do yeah. have well before Ibn Ashur. We, we yeah. have to go all the way back to, to people like Ibn Sahnoon, people like Ibn. Some of, but I mean, in, talk, in terms of post postmodern, because we're talking about after after the independence movements of many of these Muslim countries in the fifties and so and so. Ibn Ashur, if I remember, died in nineteen fifty something or something like that. Is that is that correct or what? Sure, sure. I mean. Teacher education, of course, has picked up. I don't think we have really time to go into that. Yeah. But none of this, of course, the, my point about teacher education is yeah. within the Muslim minority context. Right. So in Europe, we don't have, with the exception of probably Austria, yeah. we don't have well, well worked out yeah. qualification frameworks of the 
basically training educators. Essentially a PGCE for Islamic. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Otherwise, of uh, course, in the, yeah. in the Muslim world, there are, of course, no. teacher education models. But coming back to Brother's last question, it was a really good mm. question. Uh, so it takes you to put into a historical context of this educational reform and challenges. If you right. do that, then you realize what made Islamic classical Islamic higher learning creative, mm -hmm. and gradually what actually became stagnated, sadly. Mm -hmm. And North Africa is a good example because even Khaldun is a brilliant example, who in the 14th century begins to notice the problems. And his muqaddim, as you know, is really part of critique, just like Ghazali centuries before him, critique of how knowledge and being a knowledgeable authority was mm -hmm. really rethought and reconsidered. Both of them are pre-modern. So our problems were not simply begun with the colonial encounter yeah. as such. Yeah. The problems were actually much deeper than this. Right. And we don't have time to go into that analysis. Sure. So we've got another question again from, uh, I think, Sanil. Sanil, I've just, I've just unmuted you. And then we're going to have Ricky after that. Hey, Sanil. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Wachun bashush. We have found a base that I've forgotten even. How are you, Sanal? No, not too bad, alhamdulillah. Allah barik fikum. Um, I have a brief question about assessment, really. Um, obviously, I was blessed, mashallah, to participate in the early days of the Mark Field um, master's program uh, and benefit uh, hugely from uh, Dr. Shaheen. Um, I have a question about the index that you have um, produced in Kuwait, um, assessing religiosity, iman, uh, akhlaq, adab, um, and so on and so forth. So we've already learned about that index and how much. So um, I'm really trying to work that out into a practical model as well at our school where I teach. Um, and um, I'm, I'm still in, in two minds about how much it makes sense to measure and assess mm. religiosity, iman, akhlaq, adab, taqwa, uh, all these very in intrinsic and you know complicated kind of um yeah, yeah how do you measure behavior does it make sense if yes is it accurate and maybe the third question if if that index ha has has happened something to it you know did you develop it did you make something is there an alternative to measuring behavior um, in, in the educational perspective but then maybe religiosity beyond just behavior exactly Excellent question. Very good. Thank you. Very good. I remember you, Sanal, from your wonderful thesis, actually, where you looked at, I remember, isn't it, you were putting into practice some of the curriculum ideas for of Bloom Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy, yes. That's right. So if, if you remember Bloom Taxonomy, isn't it, it begins with low-level thinking, high-level thinking, isn't it? Obviously, Bloom Taxonomy is not God-given framework. You, know, you could always criticize. But as you can see, as an educator, having a tool to tell you where your students are operating, the way they ask questions, the way they respond to your query, the way they do their homework, isn't it? So you can tease out where students are operating, isn't it? So think of this religiosity model just like that, actually. It is nothing more than a tool that gives us some di diagnostic information. And you are right, we are not measuring religion, morality as such, in fact, the word measure is really not appropriate in this context, is to explore diagnostically where somebody is. So isn't it our preferred word, word, word was tadayun, religiosity, yeah? So because obviously you can't really measure something you cannot see, uh, but you can see how that belief iman, isn't it? Exhibit itself in somebody's behavior, understanding, isn't it values? So you can see it just like Iman and Islam concept, isn't it? Iman is in the heart, Islam is, you know, you can see with prayer. So think of like this, the idea of measurement is a bit misleading. We're not really kind of positivistic, you know, measure something like a tree. How many trees are there in this classroom and can come and tell me? It's not like this, but it is not, not impossible either. So therefore, isn't it, the, the model I was humbly developing was called really Tadayun, you know, try to understand how somebody interprets being a young Kuwaiti Muslim and interacting with the Quran, with the Hadith, with the Suluk, isn't it? And then telling you what they think. And then we have obviously 
what we call performance indicators, as it were, cognitively, affectively, emotionally, socially. You can kind of put the word index is a good one. So you can put where the person is, person is, is operating. So if somebody is overwhelmingly telling you that he has no answers, no interest in religion, just follow the parent, well, psychologically, isn't it? Then Tadeyun becomes rather foreclosed. You don't need to be rocket scientist to do that. Now, the beauty about this for education is because education is all about trans facilitating change and growth. If our education model does not accommodate change and development, none of this will make sense. So we want children, when they come to our care, to develop emotionally, cognitively, isn't it, behavior-wise, over the years. We have to find a way to say that you can observe or cannot observe this. So the problem is because in our, sadly, in our Islamic institutions, we do not study psychology of religion. Most of this doesn't make sense. And I would say, if you look at developmental psychology, psychology of religion, just like the Bloom taxonomy, just think of like that. You can see that there are various ways of exploring where a learner is. So if I'm interested in the suluk, in the, in the adept and moral, isn't it? I can find out whether children are aware of what taqwa is, even if they have very small understanding, and how could they actually exhibit in their daily interaction in the school taqwa-related value practices. This could be observed. And as a teacher, if you are having also a research interest, you can make a note of this and gradually build a profile. Say, my goodness, we need to do X, Y, Z. So Sanat, the idea of measurement is nothing beyond that this, as simple as this. And as such, we are developing evidence-based, isn't it, research-based, I suppose, development in Islamic education. And just to see what kind of tadayun we are fostering. And are they really and your terminologies to... are specific. We have to be careful. That's right. Term... So yeah. we, we obviously need to have maybe a discussion on the terminology. Mm. Come on. But that is the basic idea. I think because I remember you work with Bloom Taxonomy, it's just like that. It's like I said, I mean, I mean, the danger really is if it's misunderstood and if the yeah, whole sure. measurement is a, a, a purely theoretical practice, uh, a number crunching practice. No, um, of course, of course. What, what we try to do at our school is more involve a kind of a 360 holistic assessment approach. With so you're using the model in an in Islamic school, just for people's sake. You, yes, you run an Islam, yes. You're a head teacher in Islamic school. You're using Definitely. that idea in an Islamic school. So there is some, and, and are you seeing some of the practical benefits of it just out of interest? Of the, some of the ideas, because obviously you've done the program. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> we have uh, revamped the entire vision and, and, and curriculum and pedagogy at our school, and we're still in that process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and you've seen some of the outcomes achieved because I know we'll you know outcomes and outputs. It sounds as far as they as far as they go. Yes, but it obviously takes a long time to change, implement, uh, try, trial, test, uh, yeah. work on, and. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely, 100%, yes. Yeah, great. So, so we've really got a final question from Ricky Baines. Ricky, I'm just unmuting you. I know we've got loads of questions coming through. I don't want to take advantage of Dr. Shah. You Charles answer them, it's, it's your responsibility. Oh, well, I'm telling people, read the book first. We can't do it. You, you are our quick book quick and authority, no, read please. One thing about my book review discussions, I really hold on to people. Don't ask <laughs> questions if you don't if you haven't read the book. Yalla. Good, Ricky. good. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I just want to, uh, so myself, I work in uh, Darul Uloom and, and I've done some research in Darul Uloom and I, I intend on doing some research in the future. So I just wanted to comment on perhaps like the value of empirical research as we've been discussing. Um, so if it's research that's based on observation and sort of exploring and understanding a particular phenomena where, and I think this is particularly needed in the Darul Ulooms where there's an empathetic approach to the research. We understand the, stu the students and the teachers' beliefs as articulated by the teachers and the students in these very unique sort of institutes, understanding their uh, perspectives. So gathering, the, gathering data, gathering empirical, doing empirical research, uh, getting the accounts of the stakeholders and then developing models and frameworks. Because sometimes a lot of what you hear is there's, there's a presumption of what is going on inside the Darul Ulooms in 2020 yes. in British Darul Ulooms. Like, uh, thinking that it's an exclusively transmission instructional model is, is, is exactly that. It's a presumption because there's no empirical data basically to, to back that up. So exactly. speaking, to, speaking to graduates and saying, oh, graduates are X because of some, because this is the model that they follow. 
it's presuming that they, they don't have uh, a more varied approach to pedagogy or teaching models, or it's presuming what the motivations are of the teachers and the students. It's presuming what the curriculum is. There's no, there's no empirical data for any of these things. So we don't really have a clear picture as to what's going on on the ground. And until mm. we sort of do that, I think, I think any, any attempt at models, frameworks and theories is jumping the gun. Do you, think Allah 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 Vicky, do you think they're in denial or they don't want to or do you think you know i'm a Darul graduate my teachers for nearly since uh you know uh, nizam al-mulk who got the idea of the whole nizamiya model and they somehow yeah. weighed it down a couple of hundred years later to yeah. um, delhi we don't need to move we don't need to change we know best what do you think mm. what do you think so I've, I've definitely encountered those kind of people but mm. i think if you if you look on the ground in british Darul Ulum, and you compare it to even What's happening in Pakistan and India? There are significant differences in the in the curriculum, the syllabus, what's being taught, and the way that it's sure, being taught. But are they producing the goods? You see, people in, in for example, if you were to compare the Dutch alums in, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, we'd have to speak to them and 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 see exactly what they see as being producing the goods, so to speak. We don't know what their motivations are. We don't know. Right. We don't know what they deem to be successful. Do they have this functionless kind of output thing where mm. we're going to have a, 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 an imam mm. that gives an amazing khutbah and and mm. and like? Is, is that exactly what they're, they're going for? So when you speak yeah. to the teachers, I think mm. they, they mm. come from very different perspectives and, and what they expect from a graduate are, are drastically different. Sometimes. So we can't presume these things is, is essentially my, my point. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly. yeah that's Ricky, a, just stay on, Ricky. Just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. a very good point, Ricky. I think you've, you've kind of, it's good that this is the last question because you just put the value of empirical research in its proper context, absolutely. Mm. If you don't have empirical understanding, isn't people will develop stereotypes, mis misunderstanding and misconceptions. So clearly, uh, you know, having empirical evidence, it will communicate what you know learning and teaching is all about in a Darul because it's a very you know enclosed space. Is nobody knows what's going on, and people have all these misunderstandings. You know, it's all indoctrination, all this and that. So clearly, you are absolutely right. You know, we do need to have evidence, and that could be gathered via empirical research to just tell how people feel and what's happening there. That doesn't mean that empirical research finding is absolute. No, of course it will be challenged. So if you're interested, uh, Ricky, I think, it, again, the book, my book, because it was based on mm -hmm. three sets of data that I've gathered over 10 years. The first data set was from the sixth form college students. The second data was from Kuwaiti young people, roughly around 1000 young people we have actually surveyed. And most crucially, the third type of data came from Darulum graduates who attended my courses at Markfield over space of four or five years. So obviously you are welcome to look at and examine this data, particularly the last type of data and see what you think my assessment was, uh, whether I was, I suppose, being, you know, um, engaging with Darulum, uh, basically uh, graduates, because it tells you what goes on in, in, that, in that particular space. And I know this because I myself come from Maybe it's very old uh, you know, history, but I do come from a kind of a Darulum type of theological training myself. Mm -hmm. So I understand the traditional teaching and learning. So in other words, we do have three types of data. And of course, you're welcome to examine the data, particularly the third type of data, which was gathered from Darulum graduates, which <clears throat> tells us how they conceived what Islamic higher learning is all about, how they conceived what is worthy of teaching and learning, and how they taught and learned. Whether I, I was justified to say that maybe it's all to do with teacher text and transmission centered model. Uh -huh. That was my summary of what was going on. But, uh -huh. And that it was based on what I was hearing from the graduates. But obviously like any empirical data, it's always open for challenge. This is how really our understandings evolve. <clears throat> it's really lovely to have empirical studies within Darulum to create transparency, to just say, look, here we go. This is what we teach, this is our curriculum. These are educational aims so that we have totally openness. And that would be a really brilliant thing to do, in fact. Uh, and we can only do that if we have <coughs> a strategy of cool. empirical research, you know, conducting, and then obviously opening up a study, the, the provision that we offer, basically. Fantastic. Great. Look, uh, we're yeah. going to end a little. Uh, yeah, Ricky, you want to make a comment? Or? No, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, Misa, uh, if I can just. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, so yeah, I was going to share Mohammed. What, what, yes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sheikh Mahan, do you want to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jazakallah Khairan. Okay, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I just want to say, yeah, mm. uh, I think uh, Ricky has hit the nail on the head there. But, um, uh, you know, on the flip side, I think it's also about the 
um, you know, like we're talking about stereotypes of the Darul Ulum, mm. but then there's also the hagiographical kind of side mm. of the Darul Ulum as well. Mm. So a lot of what we have out there is where everything's wonderful, everything's good, mm. um, and then you've got the other. So you've got the two extremes. But then again, as as was mentioned, the presumption is that it's either this extreme or that extreme. But with the research, you know, that will really show okay, what's going on, um, what's the good, what, what's best practice. And that's that's good practice and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's really important. Yeah, Jazakallah khairan. Dr. Excellent. Shahin, what's the plan for the next 10 years? So I'm going to interview in 10 years' time. You've had another, so you've had 20 years of the Abdullah Shahin's model. I am going to have a, peace, I'm going to have a peaceful life. You're not going to be in touch with me 10 years. Why not? So I'm the <laughs> Rizal <laughs> Mulk, right? You're in my zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, 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 what are we expecting in the next 10 years? Oh, plenty, program. plenty, inshallah. Are we going plenty. to see Abdullah Shahin's program in exported to the Islamic universities? Uh, is it going to take over the Islamization of knowledge? Uh, is that I know your you, hope? You are, you are, I know you are being provocative. Uh, I'm not being provocative. I'm just asking some good questions because <laughs> I want to see. Uh, what, I want to what, see the Muslim um, world advance. I don't want to hear yeah. the same old questions about oh. Um, you know, shall we go to the moon? And is it going to be this and that? Um, and 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 so and so. Look, we need to move on. What, what what's, well, what's the score here? What score is? I mean, I genuinely, when I embark on my journey, mm -hmm. honestly, I did not have any expectation. Why? Because, as you know, you know, I come from Turkey, and Britain obviously is all Southeast Asian, so I have always felt like an outsider within, you know, within, within, within the wider story. Of well, you eat more story. curry than most of us, so you're an insider. Yeah, although I, I, although I enjoy the curry and the, you know, <laughs> discovering of the cuisine of, of Bangladesh or Pakistan, yeah. <laughs> but I, I feel, reflecting back, subhanAllah, I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe Mashallah. had something destined for me. He kind of picked me, <laughs> put me into this context where I really have got no political grudge or ideological interest because I don't come from none of the networks. But the, the reality is we have to be also be very clear. You're an outsider at the end of it. Yeah. The, the fact is we, we have networks, tra mm. transnational networks. Networks means business, loyalties, ideologies. We have to be really, we, we had no time to analyze this, yeah. how power structures, the way in which education functions. So I, I, I have really none of, none of this, I would say, baggage in, in the sense that I, I don't have really a particular, you know, take on anything, apart from as much as I could discern Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, obviously, uh, message and the way I understood it and the way I want to put it. So in other words, I really felt this educational vocation mm -hmm. given to me, and, and I kind of spent all my time and effort into creating a model, I suppose, you know, but it is a model. It cannot be the model. Of course. What yes. what I can say is, from my humble experience, I've been really lucky because I got students really empowered this, and now gradually the community is owning. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> the point is, we need to find a way to make education space creative, resourceful, empowering, inclusive. Islamic education, that, specifically. Exactly, and that is right. that is within our communities means Islamic education. Right. So Islamic education in our communities could build capital. Yep. and power or sadly it could hinder but we cannot ignore because islamic education is so crucial even now with the interjection do you think we need a new mecca conference and do you think as part of that you could well, frame it with do, some of your we ideas do, we certainly need to examine our presumptions our model we need to have humbleness and humility yeah. to say this is what we've been doing it maybe we are missing out something yeah i do believe that <clears throat> ultimately ultimately islamic education is all about rid allah mm. to gain allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure Absolutely. If this sincerity is there, all we have to say is why education is not empowering young people, why we are failing to even educate our young people properly in Islamic literacy, why we are not facilitating growth into faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So clearly, Rad Allah is the key to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's any, pleasure. Any countries that you think of, for example, you're from Turkey, so we hear the great story mm -hmm. of Diyanet and and so and so. You, you are always been provocative, aren't you? Lisa? Absolutely right. What do you think? In your blood, man. You are you're an activist through and through. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to become an intellectual activist. So the point is, Ibizan, um, I do believe the issues that we are experiencing in Muslim minority contexts in Europe are not different from this Muslim majority countries. So it's the same, more or less. So yes, it is not only we are the problem. In fact, we are, of course, we are under-resourced minorities. 
but Muslim majority worlds sadly did not produce models that could guide us, unfortunately. So my criticism is actually for both in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, the future of Islam is at stake. We need to produce models of education that could actually sustain, nurture uh, Islamic, uh, I suppose, articulation of Islam in young people's lives. That can only be achieved if we have very strong Islamic education awareness, basically, facilities and resources. So I believe that a transformative model of Islamic education mm -hmm. is justified on the Quran. And, and very quickly, education. could that model work in Zaytunas or your Cambridge Muslim colleges, for example? You know, I mean, we've seen uh, Muslim, no, you know, no, yeah. no, no. How, how many people are still with us? 45, yeah, 40. 45 people. The Quran, is, the Quran is still being provocative. We have no, no nobody has, let's, let's, what do call it? Let's hunt the flowers blossom, uh, Mizan. This is mm. our attitude. Okay. Inshallah, isn't it? Mm. Uh, we, we, we need to produce models and mm -hmm. alhamdulillah people are producing models. We can oh. only exchange and see, compare. Yeah. I do yeah. believe that the transformative take on Islamic education has relevance to Maktab, Madrasa, Darulun, and hey, indeed, well. even to the Islamic uh, uh, hybrid college system. I do believe that. Right. Okay. Ultimately, we do need to really facilitate these models, but we need to examine. Education is creative when it gives space for the learners, for the stakeholders. It cannot anymore work on certain charismatic takes on certain concepts. Right. It, Islam is an egalitarian religion. Right. It's all about empowering young people to take their responsibility. Our job is not to impose anything, but right. to facilitate access to Islamic knowledge, to Islamic understanding, help them to engage with Islamic heritage. You see, right. if they don't have tools of engaging, how could they make sense of our brilliant past? So no that requires a transformative educational readiness. We right. have to cre create this. And I do believe that with our humble efforts at mm -hmm. Marfield and Warwick now, we have a model emerging. All we need is now to say, let's look at whether some of these theoretical ideas, practical applications could be transferable to our settings. And we are all more than happy to say, yes, let's, 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 let's experiment. Let's mm -hmm. see whether it works or it doesn't work. And ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, is, is the guide. And we all have to do is to share and to see whether we can actually cross fertilize, mm -hmm. put together ideas, resources, to create really institutions of higher learning where love of learning, growth into humanity, faithfulness are the key. And I think Islam really can, in a sense, achieve that by really transferring this transformative education vision for today. But we need to understand we cannot discern this transformative education unless we recognize education is a discipline on its own. Right, so one of the Islamic takeaways is Islamic education as a be subject in its own right. A discipline on its own right. right, has been my passion. If we do that, next thing is we need to really build uh, a really working models of te teacher qualification. It's right. a crucial missing element. And that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, currently Iran's we're working doing on this, others, yeah. currently working on this model and I'm hoping that within the space of one or two years with the help of community, inshallah, with the participants, we will create. And of course we need the research, so Absolutely. important. Research into history, into theology, into philosophy, also empirical research. And there's some folks I can see from Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey. I know you're watching me. And, and, and my, my Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Imran for their model. That's their right. My, my view, I have experience mm. of Indonesia. I'm very hopeful. If you mm. ask me in the Islamic world, I would say there's a lot of hope, I would say, in what the bit I know about Indonesia, mm -hmm. because there are huge Islamic university sector there, but there are also now new developments to tr create an integrated model, just like the uh, the early years, the Mecca Madrasa they have developed. So there is plenty of really models to look at. And you know, of course, within a couple of weeks later, inshallah, we're going to interview the vice president himself, of the rector, next week. National Islamic University. I'm happy, I'm looking forward to that interview, inshallah. We want to listen to people, their experiences, and to create a platform, which is Dr. Imran's idea, actually, a platform dedicated to Islamic education where we share ideas, models, research, in the hope of we can make this useful for Ummah as a whole. Exactly. There's two billion people out there. We need to, and the more the merrier, the more models Inshallah. the merrier, and the more models so the merrier. I, would, I thank you again for you for giving us. No, no, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Imran. Thank you, for, Imran, thank you for, for Muhammad, for, uh, for uh, Dr. Imran, for everybody who has been patient with us all along our rumbling. So please excuse us if we have stepped outside the boundaries. We've gone two hours I, today rather than one hour. I, re I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed. I mean, we need to really actually empirically study Mizan's online co Islamic courses. <laughs> <laughs> effectiveness. 
You have to assess you, Mizan. That's it. No running oh, away. No, no, no. Don't worry about that, Dr. Shahid. I don't think most people can catch up. At because the because <laughs> you, are, you are offering a very good Islamic public education. That's no, no, no. It's just an online forum for, In you know, Garam Masala, sort of, you know. Uh, and and must have, have, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank, you Thank you so much, folks. I'm going to put this online very shortly. If you're not on our mailing list, please leave your email on the chat and we will send you the link. Otherwise, if you're registered, you'll get a link uh, when we send out. But just to remind everyone, uh, please do contact Dr. Abdullah Shahin at Warwick University. We'll put, we'll put the link already out there. Dr. Imran, we, you know, uh, if you just put your link on the chat as well if you don't mind, um, so people can benefit. And I'll share that out to people as well. And Sheikh Mohammed, people can get hold of you. How How can they get hold of you to talk about your study? Sheikh Mohammed, you'll give, put your link on the chat as well. So I can sure, share absolutely. it to the people, inshallah. Uh, just a reminder, next week, we have that big interview uh, with the rector of the Islamic University of uh, Malaysia. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shahini is going to be the host. So it's going to be set at one o'clock next week because of the time difference. And we're hoping to have Professor Emeritus Tan Si Dato uh, Abdul Razak, who is the rector of the Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, and that's a real big uh, coup for us as well. He's one of the most important people in Islamic education, in one of the most important institutions in the Muslim world on the subject of Islamization and Islamic education. So without further ado, thank you so much, everyone. Wish you all the best. Du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.